and I welcome you to our service this Sabbath morning in Lurgan Free Presbyterian Church. We're turning in our Bibles to the Old Testament and to the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis and the chapter 37. In the opening verses of this chapter, we are reminded that Jacob was living in the land of Canaan and that his son Joseph was now 17 years of age. Joseph bringing to his father a report of his brethren's evil behavior. We then read in the verse 3, Genesis, the chapter 37, and the verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his brethren, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Amen. We know that God will bless this reading of his own precious word to each of our hearts. In these words, our attention is drawn to Joseph. While he is hardly mentioned in the pages of the New Testament, a quarter of the book of Genesis is dedicated to his life story. In fact, he is one of a few men in Scripture of whom nothing bad is recorded. Being born as a result of prayer, his name literally means Jehovah has added. Having been added by the hand of God, his father Jacob loved him very especially. Indeed, Jacob later believing he had been devoured by wild animals. Such was his grief that his daughters were unable to console him. Shaken to his very core, he retired to his tent uh, to die mourning. And when news finally came that Joseph was not dead, but that he was alive in the land of Egypt, he was overwhelmed with joy. Such was his joy that despite his age and the dangers of the journey, we find him making his way down into the land of Egypt there to be with Joseph. And Joseph being the child of his father's old age and being added by the hand of God, we are told in verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. He not only loved Joseph more than the rest of his children, but the fact that he was willing to risk his life in going down into the land of Egypt, we discovered that he loved Joseph more than he even loved his own life. And the child of God, having been miraculously added to the family of God by the hand of God, he, like Joseph, is very especially loved. He is loved with a love that knows no end and no measure. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, taking up this theme and speaking of the love of God, he said in Ephesians chapter 2 and the verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. He described the love of God as a great love. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 15, Greater love hath no man than this. And his love is infinite, and more than that, it is incomprehensible. It is beyond human understanding. Taking up his pen, Frederick Lehman wrote, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. And if you are his, he loves you today. In fact, he loves you more than he loves his creation. He loves you more than he even loves himself. In fact, Christ so loved you that he gave himself to go and to die upon Calvary's cross. And in those moments when you feel unloved, when you feel hated by the world around you, despised perhaps even by friends, remember this great truth, that you are loved, loved with a, an everlasting love. God loves you more than he loves this world. He loves you more than he even loves himself. 
and for you he will turn this world even on side down. Joseph was very especially loved. And so I want to draw your attention to Joseph as a type or a picture even of the believer. And I want you to notice firstly here the clothing he donned. The Jews were not usually given to outlandish dress. However, seeking to distinguish Joseph and to set him apart from the rest of his brethren, Jacob gave to him a very special robe. You notice here that it was a covering robe. Setting the weavers to work, we read in verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. The word color there can be variously translated as well as indicating color. It could also be rendered as ends or extremities. And as such, unlike the ordinary shepherd's robe, which had no sleeves and came only to the knees, allowing him to perform his duties more freely, this robe, as the word indicates, reached to every extremity. It came not only to the palms of his hands, but it reached right down to the very soles of his feet. It covered every part of his being. And like Jacob, the Lord has given to his children a very special robe, the robe of his perfect righteousness. And as well as being lovely, it is long, covering every part of our lives. Indeed, the prophet Isaiah, looking back to that time when he came to the cross, he said in Isaiah chapter 61 and the verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. And he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as well as covering him with the garments of salvation, he covered or he adorned him with his perfect righteousness. And the robe of Christ's righteousness is not only complete, but it is comprehensive. It covers every part and every period of our lives. The great Puritan writer Thomas Brooks taking up his pen, he said, it goes all over from top to toe. And the righteousness of Christ covers every part of our lives. It's interesting to note that as you read through the life of Joseph, there is not one negative thing said about him. There is no defiling sin, no dirty stain, and there are no dark spots recorded in his life. That's not because Joseph did not sin, because the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But being covered or clothed in the righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Christ, is every sin, is every sin was covered. Realizing that great truth, Nicholas Ludwig von Zinderdorf wrote, Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay. And it was not because the hymn writer had no sins to answer for in his past life, but because they had been forgiven. And they had been covered by the perfect righteousness of Christ. You see, at the cross, not only were our sins forgiven, but in that moment we were given a new robe, a robe of perfect righteousness that covered every part of our lives. Sometimes the devil will come to you, and when you're downcast, he will whisper in your ear. And by his words, he'll take you back, and he'll remind you of the sins of childhood. He reminds you of sins that were committed yesterday. But believer, you can come to the devil and you can say, I don't know what you're talking about because every sin has been forgiven. Every sin has been covered by the robe of Christ's perfect righteousness. And you see today, as God the Father looks down, 
He sees not your tattered righteousness, but he sees the robe, robe that was woed by Christ's perfect obedience. He sees his perfect righteousness. Oh, how privileged we are. My being redeemed, we were given a new robe, a robe that covers every part of our lives, a robe of perfect righteousness. But not only was it a covering robe, but it was also a conquering robe. Instructing the weavers in the making of this robe, we read in verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. When we go forward into the book of Judges, we find the same type of robe being mentioned again. Speaking concerning jail, as said in Judges 5 verse 30, a prey of diver colors of needlework, meat for the necks of them that take the spoil. And it seems that the colorful robe was reserved for the neck of those who had conquered and those who had taken many spoils. Indeed, putting on this robe, Joseph later saw his father and his brethren on two separate occasions bowing down before him. You see, this robe, it was the robe of a conqueror. And in loving us, the Lord has not only clothed us with his purity, but he has crowned us with his power. He has made our enemies to bow down before us. Indeed, reminding the Roman believers of that great truth, Paul taking up his pen, he said in Romans 8 verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In order to understand what he meant by the phrase, all these things, we must go back into the previous verses. There we find him listing seven separate things. Seven being the number of completion. He was here not only promising complete victory, but by adding the words more than conquers, he was indicating that this victory would be easy. And you see, through Christ, we are not merely conquerors, but we are super conquerors. There is no defilement. There is no device. There is no demon that we cannot overcome. Hudson Taylor was a great pioneer missionary. He went to the land of China to bring to them the gospel. Speaking from his own experience, he said, we are a supernatural people, born again by a supernatural birth, led by a supernatural captain to assure victory. And you see, at the cross, that moment we looked away from self and we looked to the Savior and we're converted we became conquerors. And there is no sin, no temptation, no device, no habit that we cannot, through Christ, overcome. You see, believer, you don't need to live in defeat. You don't need to live in bondage. You don't need to bow down before those sins. You don't need to bow down before those habits. You're a victor. In Christ you can overcome. You can make every sin to bow down before you. Oh, what victory there is in Jesus. And I wonder, are you experiencing that victory? It was also a colorful robe. Describing it, he said, verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his brethren because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. Colors are but the various shades and reflections of light. Indeed, experts tell us that light is made up of seven separate colors. And as such, this robe being made of many colors, it was merely reflecting or showing forth in a visible way all the shades that were contained in light. And of course, Christ is the light of the world. 
And like Joseph, we are not to be shrouded, but we are to be showing forth Christ, who is the light of the world. We are to be reflecting every shade of his character and being. Indeed, the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20, in the verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And rather than setting forth a shade or a certain aspect of Christ, he set him forth in all of his fullness, revealing every shade, every aspect of his life. And you see, we're not to be reflecting self, but rather we are to be reflecting the Savior, revealing him in every shade of his work and his being. Several years ago, there was a young man killed in a tree in an accident. An inquiry was set up, and at the inquiry, the watchman or the guard was summoned before the inquiry to see had he given the necessary warnings concerning the incoming train. Stating that he had waved his lantern, the inquiry was closed and a verdict of accidental death was passed. But you know, as the watchman left the inquiry that day, he was heard to mutter, I'm glad they didn't ask me about the light in the lantern because it had gone out. And I wonder today, has your light gone out? Are you setting forth Christ? Are you seeking to set him forth in every aspect of his life and his being? Not only setting forth his love, but setting forth his word, setting forth his perfection, setting forth that he's coming, even in judgment once again. You see, we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And more than that, we're clothed with power. And being clothed in his righteousness and having power, we're not to be silent, but we're to be revealing Christ in all of his fullness. And I wonder, believer, have you revealed him even this week? Have you set him forth to a world that is perishing? But I think in these words, not only do we notice the clothing he donned, but surely we also notice the courage he displayed. While favoring Joseph, Jacob by no means spoiled him. Coming of age, he sent him out into the fields to work there alongside his brethren. And living in the field, you notice here that he did not conform to their lifestyle. Though surrounded by wickedness in every hand, so we read in verse 2, Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brethren and the lad was with the sons of Bela and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph bought, brought unto his father their evil report because of the danger of wild animals and deceitful and dishonest sheep. Jacob sent Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher with them. Naphtali being later described by his father as a hind lad. Loose. He was a young man who was hard to restrain. Gad's name meaning true. It seems that he was perhaps a bit of a bully. And breaking through the natural bounds of decency, they, along with their other brethren, sank down into the very depths of sin and the depths of iniquity. Why their particular sin is not revealed here, what is made clear is that although Jacob or Joseph uh, was at the impressionable age of 17, he refused to join with them. Though he was bullied, though cajoled by them, he stood apart. He dared, he dared, despite his company, to be different. And you see, while we are in the world, we're not to be off this world. We're not to be yielding to its vile philosophies and practices. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, taking up his pen, writing unto the Roman believers, he said in Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Have you ever taken a jelly, melted it down, and then poured it into, uh, into a mold? And when it is set, it ha- takes its shape. And as such, Paul was telling them here not to be conformed or not to be molded into this world's practices and philosophies. You see, rather than being conformist, we are to be non-conformist, not conform to the devices and the defilements of this present evil world. You know, it's been rightly said, the Christian must live in the world, but he must not let the world live in him. You say, preacher, that sounds very good, but what's the difference? There is a vast difference. The boat is in the sea. However, when the sea begins to come into the boat, the boat is in danger of sinking. Someone once came to the great reformer, John Knox, and said, Mr. Knox, all the world is against you. John Knox looked up and he said, then John Knox is against the whole world. And you see, rather than conforming to this world, Rather than conforming to its behavior, to its morality, to its language, to its lifestyle, we are to be different. We live in a world where there's that constant pressure, pressure to be like everyone else. But we're not to be shaped by society, but we are to be shaped by the scriptures and by the Spirit. Oh, believer, don't be conformed to this world. So easy when we are with those who do wrong to go with the tide. But we're not to be old, dead fish going with the tide. We're living believers. We're to be going against the tide of this world, standing against its corruption and wickedness. Not only did he not conform to their lifestyle, but notice also he did not connive at their lifestyle Seeing their activities, <clears throat> read in the verse 2, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bela and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph was not a tale-tale, but rather he was a truth teller. Being commissioned by his father, he took his responsibility seriously. Gazing upon his brethren, he not only saw their actions to be sin, but despite his relationship with them, he might expose their behavior. And you see, there must not only be a recognizing of sin, but there must be a revealing of sin, an exposing of that corruption wherever it may be found. Indeed, Eli, seeing the vile activities of his own sons, we read in 1 Samuel 2, verse 23, and he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. While his actions here were rather late in the day, yet now rather than excusing their sin, we find him exposing their sin. And while in life at times it's easier to be silent than to speak, yet we are to speak rather than be silent. We're to expose sin and corruption and error wherever they may be found. Sadly, some today, and they're able to recognize sin when it's afar off. They're able to look across the world. They're able to see the lifestyle of other individuals and to expose their sin and their corruption. They're able to look into the courts of government and expose the errors that are there. But you know, when it comes into the church, they don't seem to be able to see it. When it comes into their own home, when it comes into their own hearts, They can no longer see it. You see, like Joseph, we're not to be covering up 
sin. Wherever that sin, whether it's in society, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in our hearts, we're to reveal it. We are to expose it. Not only did he not convive, connive at their sin, but notice he did not cover up their lifestyle. Unable to turn his brethren away from their sin, what did he do? He went up and he told his father. He said it before him. And while we have no power to turn men from their sin, our heavenly Father has. And in our distress, let us follow Joseph's example. Let us go and let us tell our heavenly Father. The hymn writer said, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And perhaps there has sin, and, and you have seen that sin. And you have spoke to that brother about it, or you spoke to that individual, and they didn't want to hear. You say, preacher, what should I do? Go and tell your father. Tell your father in heaven. He has power to intervene. He has power to change lives. Oh, what courage this young man displayed. And I wonder, do you have his courage? Are you standing up? And like Joseph, are you standing out? for the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, lastly, I want you to notice there was the cost he discovered. Putting on his father's robe and exposing his brethren's sin, the storms of hatred and malice quickly began to blow. You notice here the origin of their hatred. We read in verse four, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. In the space of a few verses, we are told three times over of their hatred. Not able to confine this hatred in their hearts and breaking forth into their speech, they eventually lay hands on him and they cast him down into a pit. And when you examine this portion a little more closely, you will find that while their hatred sprung from the fact that his father loved him, it was found by Joseph's words, by his witness. And the speaking of the truth does not always bring applause. It often brings antagonism. It stirs the hatred and malice of man. The Lord Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 13, verse 13, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sakes. And those whom God loves, this world will hate. And that hatred will be found by the speaking of his word. Don't be surprised when you go to that individual and you tell them the word of God. Tell them, my, not only that they're a sinner, but tell them the love of God. They'll get annoyed. They'll get angry. My, the world doesn't like to hear the truth. But remember that when this world hates you, it's a sign that you're loved of God. Oh, believer, be aware. Be prepared. When you speak the truth, there will be antagonism. Friends will despise you, perhaps turn against you. Not only the origin of their hatred, but there was the overruling of this hatred. The, their hatred igniting murderous thoughts, they eventually took Joseph and they cast him down into a pit, prevented by Reuben from shedding his blood. They then took him and they sold him into slavery. However, while they meant this for evil, the Lord used it to bring him into the land of Egypt where he exalted him. And there, rising out of the dust, he became prime minister. You see, God is sovereign, overruling the very poison of hell. He turns it into protein to build and strengthen the believer. You know, the eagle soaring up into the heavens, sometimes the wind begins to blow. And when it begins to blow with a great ferocity, rather than turning and going with the wind, it spreads its wings and it flies into the wind. And the wind catching the wings lift it up and lift it higher into the heavens. 
And you know why this world will come in the storms of hatred. And by that hatred seek to destroy you. Yet if only you look to Christ, rest in him. God will take those storms to lift you higher. And to bring you closer even to himself. What a God we serve. He's able to take the very attacks of the enemy and use them for our good. Also notice here the overcoming of this hatred. Why his brethren hated him and cruelly treated him. Yet they eventually, coming up into the land of Egypt, Joseph did not extract revenge. Seeing their plight, he inviting them in before him. He gave them bread. And you know, rather than seeking revenge, we're to feed the hater, opening the word of God to feed them upon the living bread. And perhaps there is that individual and they have shown great malice against you. You say, preacher, what should I do? My friend, give them the living bread. Give them the living bread. Set before them the word of God. How privileged we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, given power. Let us therefore, like Joseph, stand against the errors of our day. And let us tell the love of Christ. And of course, Joseph is also a type of the Savior. And despite his brother's bitterness and hatred, we find that he forgave them. He frankly forgave them. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is willing today to forgive you. If only you come and you fall before his throne and acknowledge that you have sinned and that you have wronged him, the king of glory, he will frankly forgive you. And if you have not already experienced his love, I trust you'll experience it today and receive that special robe that covered in the righteousness of Christ and being able then to live, to live for him. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for Calvary. We rejoice that our sins, which were many, are forgiven. We thank thee for that robe of righteousness. We thank thee for victory. And Lord, having received these things, help us therefore in our society to stand for thee, to expose error. And we rejoice that if we stand for thee with that confidence that thou would watch over us. Remember those who have never met thee, who are still at enmity with thee. Lord, open their hearts and draw them safely unto thyself, even this day. For Jesus' sake we pray.